Hi there, my name is Harry Teagle. I work for the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, or AFBI. And as part of Invasive Species Week 2023, I'm here today to talk to you about the zebra mussel, a little bit about its origins and its spread through Europe and some of the impacts that the zebra mussel can have on invaded systems. I'll also be talking to you a little bit about our current research in Loch Ney, which is research funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs through an evidence and innovation grant. So we'll be looking at a little bit about the origins of the zebra mussel, where it comes from, and a little bit about its native range. Um, some ways that you might go about identifying a zebra mussel if you happen to come across it in the wild. Some of the impacts that zebra mussels can have on invaded systems. Um, a little bit of a short history on the range expansion and the spread of the zebra mussel to Europe um, and its arrival in Ireland as well. A short introduction to Loch Ness as a water body. Um, and a brief history of the invasion of Loch Ness by the zebra mussel. Um, and then a little bit about our recent research, which we're currently conducting in Loch Ness. And then a little bit at the end there about uh, zebra mussel controls, just to wrap everything up. So zebra mussels are actually native to the Ponto-Caspian region, uh, which is down here, as you can see on the map. And this includes the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, and the Sea of, sea of Azov. Um, and it was first recorded as a species in 1769 in an oxbow lake in the lower Ural River in what is now modern day Kazakhstan. And it was originally classified as Mytilus polymorphus uh, due to its apparent similarities to the marine mussel uh, in the genus Mytilus, which I'm sure you've all seen on the rocky shore around the coastline. Um, and part of that confusion was down to the fact that zebra mussels, uniquely in freshwater mussels, can actually produce bissel threads, which are small thread-like structures which allow them to cling to hard substrates like rocks, as well as each other. And that's seen commonly in, in in marine mussels, but uh, is actually quite unique in freshwater mussels. Um, it was later reclassified into a new genus and is now Drysena polymorpha, which it remains to this day. So the, the zebra mussel is called the zebra mussel because of the quite distinctive uh, zigzag stripes on the shell, as you can see here. Um, it has a broadly triangular shape, uh, as you can see. Um, and it grows to somewhere around 50 mil, uh, five centimeters. Uh, but generally, if you find it in the world, it will be much smaller than that and more or less around the size of your fingernail or your thumbnail. Um, crucially, and one of the best ways to identify a zebra mussel is that it will actually sit flat on a surface when you place it on its ventral edge, which is this edge here. And as you can see, broadly triangular in shape and it will sit flat on a flat surface like a table. And that's a really useful uh, identification feature. Um, now, the main confusion on the identification of the zebra mussel will most likely be with uh, the closely related um, and also invasive uh, mussel, the quagga mussel, um, which has actually recently just been found in Ireland a couple of years ago. Um, but the uh, quagga mussel is generally lighter in colour. Um, more rounded in shape and crucially uh, doesn't actually sit flat on a surface. So as you can see, this is again the, the lateral view um, and it's sitting on its ventral edge here, um, and, but will most likely if placed on a flat surface actually fall over. So if you're ever in doubt, uh, say you found a mussel out in the wild and if you're ever in doubt on what you're actually dealing with, with species you have, uh, just pop it down flat on its edge on, on a table or another flat surface. And if it sits up, it's, it's more than likely uh, a zebra mussel. So just how invasive are zebra mussels? Uh, they are among the most notorious invasive species in, in the world and are quite often, in, uh, quite often included in the top 100 invasive species globally in the list that come out from time to time. Um, they have potential to cause massive ecological and economic impacts on invaded systems and part of the reason they are successful invaders is for a few, few reasons. Uh, they're well adapted to live in a range of different aquatic uh, habitats. They can survive out of water for, for a prolonged period of time, far longer than you'd expect, occasionally up to two weeks in the right uh, conditions. And they reproduce prolifically and produce uh, planktonic larvae, which means that it only takes a couple of adults to get into a, to a new uninvaded water body um, for them to be able to spread uh, quite rapidly from there. So one of the main things that zebra mussels are famous for is biofouling. Um, as I've mentioned, zebra mussels settle into hard substrates like rocks or, or metal or whatever it might be using their bissel threads. 
which I mentioned earlier. And under the right conditions, they can quickly form dense aggregation on these services. Um, and records from America and Canada, the Great Lakes over there, um, have recorded uh, densities of up to or over 700,000 individuals per meter squared. And actually the highest uh, densities ever recorded were on um, sub submerged aquatic plants in a river in the Ukraine, where scientists recorded over 9 million individuals per meter squared. Um, now, <laughs> these dense aggregations can cause big issues when they settle on human made structures. Um, so here's some great examples of that. We've got, this is a canal wall here, which is was really badly fouled. These two uh, things here are sensor arrays, and this is obviously the propeller of a boat. Um, and they can also completely clog uh, intake pipes or waterworks or hydroelectrical in installations as well. So they can cause massive problems and a lot of expense for, for humans. They also, as well as impacting uh, human built structures, zebra mussels can also have a massive impact on native wildlife through their biofouling. Um, native unionid mussels can suffer high mortality and even local extinction following the invasion uh, of a zebra mussel. Um, and here's a photo I actually took uh, last summer in Loch Ney. And as you can see, this is a native unionid mussel here, and this would kind of be this size if, if you could see through these zebra mussels. This part, which isn't colonized by the zebra mussels, actually is completely submerged in the sediment when this when this mussel was alive. Um, and this, you can see the entire exposed part of that, that native mussel is completely colonized by zebra mussels. So obviously you can tell from the photo that these zebra mussels might make life quite difficult for this native mussel. Um, and they can actually restrict the ability for these mussels to move, to feed, to reproduce. Um, and because native mussels often live in very soft, unconsolidated sediment, like, like muds, the added weight of uh, all these zebra mussels can actually bury uh, these native mussels into the sediment and kill them that way. So it can be a really big problem for, for native mussels. So the ecological impacts, aside from, from biofouling on, uh, on native uh, wildlife, can generally be split into two broad categories. We've got uh, local impacts, and these are generally associated with the zebra mussel's role as an ecosystem engineer. I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then we've got uh, system-wide impacts, which are generally associated with the zebra mussel's role as a filter feeder. And I'll go over that in a, a little bit more detail as well. So uh, local impacts of zebra mussel, as I said, are generally related to their um, role as ecosystem engineer. An ecosystem engineer is a species that modify their environment in a significant way, either by creating new habitat or by modifying existing uh, conditions to suit their needs. So a good example of this to get your head around what an ecosystem engineer is, is would be trees in a forest. Not only do they vi provide habitat on their trunk and in their leaves and things like that, they also alter the surrounding environment, create shade, uh, block wind, things like that. Um, for other organisms. Um, and another great example is, is beavers, which obviously drastically change their riverine environments uh, by cutting down trees and building dams and flooding areas like that. So zebra mussels are ecosystem engineers um, in that they, they cover the sediment, they settle onto the substrate, rocks or, or what, what have you, and create a three-dimensional habitat that would otherwise not exist without them being there. Um, and as much as I'd love to go on about um, how terrible zebra mussels are, and they are, don't get me wrong, but they've actually been recorded to have a, a positive impact on epifaunal invertebrates. So here's a great picture, and this is from, uh, I believe, Lake Erie in the uh, Great Lakes in America. And as you can see, this is, this is the bottom of the lake, and it's completely covered by this, this uh, mat of zebra mussels. And that is the, the three-dimensional habitat that I'm talking about that wouldn't otherwise exist without them. Um, so as I said, they can actually have a positive impact on epifaunal invertebrates, and these are invertebrates that live on or just above the, the substrate. Um, and they can increase their abundance by not only increasing habitat space, like I mentioned, but also providing a source of food through muscle waste. Um, so this, they've shown to have an, a positive impact on, on uh, amphipods. This is a small crustacean amphipod. This is the, uh, the larvae of a non-biting midge, of a coronamid. Um, and also worms and uh, leeches and a whole host of other uh, uh, invertebrates as well. 
So system-wide, uh, we move away from local impacts into system-wide impacts. Um, and these are generally linked to the fact that like most muscles, uh, zebra mussels are filter feeders. So they, they kind of suck in the water, remove the partic particulate matter from the surrounding water column. And in high abundances, uh, which is obviously common in zebra mussels, as we've spoken about, they can uh, decrease the concentrations of cestin. And this is a, a fancy word for, for particulate matter that's within the water column, as well as phytoplankton as well. Um, and this, in turn, has a knock-on effect, as you can imagine, by increasing water clarity, increasing water transparency, um, um, which again has, a, has another knock-on effect um, of increasing the coverage of macrophytes um, of, of aquatic plants. Um, so obviously, aquatic plants, like all plants, need light to photosynthesize. Um, so a, re a clearing of the water can lead to increased abundance and coverage of macrophytes uh, by increasing the light that penetrates to the, the lake bed or the river bed or whatever it might be. Um, and as alongside an increase in the areas you would expect, we also see plants moving deeper into the water column as more light can penetrate uh, the water. Um, and in fact, there is a link as well, just to kind of a side note here, there is a link between zebra mussels uh, clearing the water um, and between the um, expansion or spread of invasive species of macrophyte like nuttles waterweed. So the presence of uh, zebra mussels has been shown in laboratory experiments to facilitate the growth of nuttles waterweed. And alongside that, juvenile mussels have been observed colonizing the stems of these plants so that they, they actually provide increased habitat space for the zebra mussel as well. So not only are the zebra mussels clearing the water column, allowing for the proliferation of these invasive weeds, they also are providing extra habitat space for the zebra mussel. And alongside that, drifting water weed in the water column can also help spread locally, spread um, attached mussels uh, around a water body. Um, and quite often these weeds can get tangled up in boats or, or uh, fishing equipment or things like that and uh, spread the zebra mussel that way uh, across uh, land or, or to different water bodies. And here's a great photo and this is a photo of Nuttall's waterweed. As you can see it's completely choked this, this small pond here and has taken up all the available space. So as I mentioned before, the zebra mussel's native range is the Ponto Caspian Basin, which is around here. Um, and it's been there since the last uh, glaciation, last ice age, which is 10,000 years ago or so, something like that. Um, however, after canals were built to connect the, the Black and the Baltic Seas, zebra mussels spread from the native range quite rapidly. Um, and initially, they established themselves in ports and freshwater lagoons in the Baltic Sea in the early 1800s. Um, from here, it spread to other, part, other parts of Northwestern Europe relatively quickly um, and it arrived in Great Britain in 1824, the Netherlands in 1826, Germany in 1830 and Denmark in the 1840s and these this spread can likely be attributed to um, zebra mussels, adult zebra mussels attached to timber which are being traded and transported along uh, waterways. Now uh, from here, its distribution spread further northwards and it reached Sweden in the 1850s and it spread also south eastwards into Central Europe, uh, probably by attaching to the hull of boats which were traveling along canals and rivers and things like that. At this point, its distribution was was uh, distribution further south, sorry, was blocked by not only the lack of river connections uh, further south, but also by mountain ranges like the Alps and the Pyrenees. Um, but fortunately for the zebra mussel and unfortunately for everybody else, the increasing popularity of recreational water sports um, allowed them to be transported to high alpine lakes attached to the hull of boats, which are being transported on trailers uh, pulled by cars and things like that. And they colonized the high alpine lakes in Switzerland around the 1960s. Um, the same vector is likely responsible for the spread to southern European countries as well, such as Italy in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, Greece and Croatia in the 1980s, Slovenia in the 1990s, Spain in 2001, and actually only very recently uh, into Portugal in 2019. Um, So following the arrival of the zebra mussel in Britain in 1824, it wasn't for another 170 odd years or so that it was actually recorded in Ireland in 1997. And it was actually recorded, the first sightings were recorded in the River Shannon. Um, and this was following the death of a tank of farm salmon in the spring of 1997. And what actually happened was the zebra mussels had colonized the inside of the intake pipe for fresh water and blocked it and, and basically starved the fish. 
Um, researchers could tell, judging by the size of the muscles, that the invasion of Ireland was likely uh, likely begun uh, much earlier than 97 and was likely around 1993 and 1994. Um, and interestingly, around this time, there were some changes in legislation uh, around um, secondhand boats in, in Great Britain um, regarding the import of used watercraft into Ireland from Britain, alongside also uh, new requirements for certificates of competence for use of secondhand boats in England. Um, and the combination of those factors likely increased the sale of secondhand boats from England to Ireland. Um, and those kind of unique circumstances likely created a window of invasion into Ireland for the zebra mussel, which hadn't existed, as I said, in the previous uh, 170 years. And recent uh, work has actually shown that the Irish populations are genetic genetically linked to English populations. So by the end of 1998, um, the zebra mussel has been recorded in all navigable regions of the Shannon, the Boyle and the Urn systems. Uh, as you can see here, this is the current distribution of zebra mussels in the Republic of Ireland. And this is from the National Biodiversity Data Center. Um, and the records from the Urn system also represent the first records of zebra mussels in Northern Ireland. That actually leads us on quite nicely to an introduction of uh, Loch Ness. Now, Loch Ness is the largest freshwater lake in Britain and Ireland. Um, it covers an area of 383 kilometers squared, um, and its associated rivers and streams drain nearly half of the land area of Northern Ireland. But despite its size, it's actually um, quite shallow with an average depth of just about nine meters. Um, and for those that don't know, this is where uh, Loch Ness is up here. And here's a closer up look. And as you can see, it's quite a distinctive shaped lake. Um, it's actually, Loch Ness is actually of uh, considerable economic and cultural importance as well, um, as it's home to the, the largest uh, wild eel fishery in Europe and the only fishery for the uh, endemic uh, uh, pollen. Loch Ness also provides drinking water for a, a million people, which is more than half the total population of Northern Ireland. And it's also an area of special scientific interest, an ASSI, uh, special protection area, and a designated Ramsar site for uh, wetland birds. Um, it's also historically been quite heavily impacted by human activity. Um, a lot of the catchments surrounding both the loch and its rivers uh, are agricultural. And so there's quite a long history of nutrient enrichment. Um, and as such, it was once considered one of the most eutrophic lakes in the world. So one of the most nutrient enriched lakes in the world. So that leads us on quite nicely to the invasion of Loch Ness. Um, and Loch Ness has the advantage compared to a lot of other uh, water bodies which have, have been invaded by the zebra mussel in Ireland is that it's not connected to any of the other major Irish water systems which have been invaded. So invasion of Loch Ness by zebra mussels was in no way guaranteed and it certainly wasn't as rapid as some of the other uh, systems which we've already talked about. But unfortunately, uh, in 2005, five adult zebra mussels were found uh, attached to the hull of a boat, which had come from elsewhere, um, that was moored in Kinnego Marina in the southeast of the loch, just here. Um, and it wasn't until uh, 2010 that zebra mussels were actually found outside of the marina, um, where they were found in the neighboring uh, Barton's Bay, just here. And for these maps, uh, the blue dots, as you can see, represent surveys that looked for zebra mussels but didn't find any. And the red dots indicate uh, that zebra mussels were found. Uh, so further surveys were carried out in 2013 um, and found adult zebra mussels um, up the eastern shore of the loch. Um, and at this point, it was suggested that further rapid expansion of the zebra mussel in Loch Ness was imminent. Uh, however, visual snorkel surveys carried out between 2015 and 2017 uh, found single adult zebra mussels in new areas, um, including on the north shore um, and the northwest part of the loch in Toome Bay up here. Um, um, and low densities of a couple of hundred adult uh, zebra mussels per meter square were recorded in Kinnego Marina. Um, so this is where our research actually comes in um, because no research, no work on zebra mussels in Loch Ness had been carried out since that survey in 2017. So it was really urgent that we, we updated our understanding of, of the distribution and the abundance of zebra mussels in Loch Ness. So in order to do that, we actually followed the same method which was used by the survey which was carried out by AFBI in 2013. Um, and we dredged 35 sites around the loch looking for the zebra mussel. So here we are. This map, each of these points represents an area that we dredged. 
and unfortunately we found zebra mussels at each site we sampled so each of these points uh, on the map here represent an area which was dredge but also an area in which we found zebra mussels so unfortunately it seems that zebra mussels are now ubiquitous in Loch Ness um, and occur in all areas of the loch and often in quite high abundances so we established that the zebra mussels are now widespread within Loch Ness um, so we wanted to look at how many uh, zebra mussels we were so what we used again was a dredge to sample 20 sites throughout the loch uh, to establish the biomass, or biomass sorry, of mussels in these areas. So here are the, the sites that we, that we uh, dredged for, um, for zebra mussels. And here is a, uh, a, an image showing the dredge, which is actually being emptied by zebra mussels into the, into the bucket. Now there's a big variation between sites um, and the weights of zebra mussels we collected vary from about 200 grams to more than 12 kilos per, per dredge. Um, and here's some great photos showing some of those uh, zebra mussels that we collected. Um, I think the most we got was about seven, uh, about sorry, three buckets, full buckets like this worth of zebra mussels. So we're talking considerable abundances uh, in some areas of the loch. And something that actually surprised us about uh, the results of our biomass dredges was the amount of zebra mussels we found in areas of soft sediment. Now, as I've mentioned, zebra mussels are really good at colonizing hard substrate like rock or metal, but generally they're not able to settle on soft sediment like uh, sand or mud. So we actually deployed a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, to investigate these areas where we caught a lot of kind of unexpected zebra mussels. And what we observed was quite large aggregations of zebra mussels in areas which we kind of assumed were going to be inhospitable to them. So this is a screenshot from a video taken on the ROV from uh, Ballyronan Bay in the southwest, uh, the northwest of the loch, sorry. And as you can see, the sediment, uh, the substrate is predominantly sand, but we get these quite large aggregations of zebra mussels growing um, seemingly on the, on the sandy substrate. Now it's, it's, quite likely that actually these mussels are growing on either native union of mussels, as I showed you before, or on small rocks. Um, and actually, while it looks quite localized in that first image, these aggregations can be quite dense. So this is a, quite a dense mat of zebra mussels. Again, this is Ballyronan Bay um, in the northwest of the loch, again, on a sandy substrate, but as you can see, it's filling kind of the entire frame with the, with the aggregation there. Um, and what's likely happening is that zebra mussels are settling onto small stones, as I said. Uh, the juveniles then develop into adults, as you can imagine. And as they die, their valves, their shells, which actually make, make up part of them, the soft tissue decays and those shells fall away onto the substrate, onto the sediment in this case. Um, and those shells become the new substrate for juvenile mussels to settle onto. So you kind of can get this ongoing expansion of zebra mussels in areas where you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be. Um, and as these, these aggregations aren't actually really attached to the lock bed, they, they are attached to small stones or mussels or something like that, but they're not really attached to a huge amount. They're almost floating on the surface of the sand or the mud. So what can happen is during periods of high wave action, so when it's very windy, and Loch Ness has a very large fetch and it is, is quite prone to quite strong wave action on the surface, um, these, these aggregations can actually become dislodged from the sediment and, and washed away. Um, and there have been reports of large aggregations, and they're called druses, these large druses being washed from Loch Ness down the, the lower river ban, um, which is the outlet from the loch in the, in the northwest. Um, and causing all sorts of problems with the eel fishery there, getting caught in nets and causing, causing all sorts of problems like that. Uh, so another aspect of our research alongside the work we're doing on uh, biomass of zebra mussels in Loch Ness is also to consider the settlement rates of zebra mussels in the loch, which hasn't uh, actually been considered up to this point. Um, and in order to do this, we deployed 35 concrete blocks throughout the loch uh, in similar areas to the areas that we did the dredges for. Um, and sediment on these blocks was actually was actually rapid. It was very quick. So obviously these blocks were deployed uh, clean, and within a couple of weeks we had uh, in the hundreds of of zebra mussels uh, settled onto them. Um, and colonization was very very uh, very very rapid over the following weeks, and we reached a peak density after 12 weeks of. Uh, and this is average, I should say, this is average results from across the study. So this is from average from all 35 blocks. And the average uh, 
uh, peak densities uh, across the study was was over two and a half thousand uh, muscles per square meter. Now, on some some blocks, certain blocks, we reached uh, densities much higher than that, and. The, the peak densities we found, oh, this is a great photo of, of the blocks. Uh, and this is uh, possibly after about uh, six to eight weeks. So you can see a lot of zebra mussels colonizing these surfaces very quickly. Um, and we use concrete partly because um, it's relatively cheap and, and, and available, but also a lot of the structures in, in the lock and in other water bodies are made of concrete. So it's a good, a good kind of proxy to, to look at settlement on some of these structures. So as I was saying, we reached peak densities of more than 25,000 muscles per square meter on some blocks. Um, and this is actually quite uh, comparable to, to other invaded systems in Europe, to the colonization we see there. Uh, so here's a graph showing uh, average densities of zebra mussels in other invaded systems. We can see uh, uh, Finland here, Ireland, Poland, and Wales. Um, and while Loch Ness is comparable, on this graph it might look like the densities are actually uh, much lower than those other countries. But it's important to note that uh, while the numbers in Loch Ness are, are high, they only represent assemblages that are only 12 weeks old or three months old. Um, and the true abundances or densities of uh, mature assemblages of zebra mussels in Loch Ness are most likely much higher than this, but currently unknown. So as I mentioned, there's a great deal we don't know about uh, zebra mussels in Loch Ness currently, and this research really is just the first step in understanding their wider impact uh, on the system. What we do know, and what's been reported quite a lot, is that water clarity in the lock has increased alarmingly over the past kind of three or four years. And as I said, one of the big system-wide impacts of zebra mussels is this cleaning of the water column that we see, the increased uh, transparency. And if you know Loch Ness, if you've ever been down to the lock or, or anything like that, you will know that the water is quite murky or historically has been quite murky. But now we have visibility, which can stretch for meters in some places. So the, the change is is considerable and it has been uh, rapid in, in, in a lot of cases. Um, and actually in response to this increase, increased water clarity, um, fishermen are actually starting to change their tactics to deal with these new conditions. Um, and the water is now so clear that instead of uh, setting their uh, eel long lines uh, earlier in the day, they're actually setting them later into the evening to avoid their the prey on the hooks on the long line being taken by by visual hunters like perch and this is a perch um, so not only do they change their their tactics in terms of um, the time that they set their their lines they're also finding that their lines and their nets are being fouled by zebra mussels quite quickly and here's a couple of great examples of that this these are nets uh, sorry these are hooks from a from an eel long line um, which have actually been fouled by zebra mussels in, and this is very quick, this is only maybe 24 hours or so uh, to, to see this effect. Um, and this is a, a net, and as you can see, these clumps of zebra mussels uh, clinging onto it there. And another problem is that because zebra mussels can be quite sharp uh, when they form these aggregations, a lot of nets can be, can be cut or become tangled in zebra mussels as well. So it's really important that we get to grips uh, with what's going in Loch Ness um, for the fishery as well. So some more work we need to do in the future is to uh, establish biomass estimates for zebra mussels in Loch Ness. Um, what we've, the work we've done, we've kind of got a rough idea of, of some of the biomass in some areas, but really need to nail these down um, and get some more accurate estimates. Because with those accurate estimates, we can begin to estimate the filtration rates of zebra mussels in Loch Ness um, and put them into an ecologically relevant context. And by filtration rate, I mean how much water are these zebra mussels filtering on a on any given time scale, whether it be a day, a week, or a year. Um, and by ecologically relevant context, I mean is the zebra is the filtration rate of zebra mussel uh, faster than the great the growth rates of phytoplankton, because um, that could have a considerable impact. Um, and another thing we don't know is that. We don't understand the patterns of reproduction in Loch Ness. Um, do zebra mussels spawn in one discrete event, which has been recorded some places, or do they spawn continuously over the entire summer, which again has been recorded in others? So getting to grips with that will really help to inform management strategies going forward in the future. Um, and another thing that'd be great to know is how zebra mussels are impacting uh, uh, benthic invertebrates, invertebrates that live on the, the lock bed. 
uh, remember earlier in the presentation I said that they can increase the abundance of these animals um, and a lot of these animals in Loch Ness are really important sources of food for, for commercially important species of fish like, like eel and pollen um, but they're also important for wild fowl for birds and other things like that so it's important to kind of get a handle on what's happening there and another thing if the, if the abundances of these organisms are increased it, it really uh, is unknown how available that prey will be. Um, obviously, if these organisms are living within the matrix uh, created by the mussels, it may be that they are inaccessible to fish and to birds, um, and that could become a problem in the future as well. So now a quick look at some potential zebra mussel controls. Uh, now, unfortunately, zebra mussels have very few natural enemies in that uh, not very many uh, species really feed on them in any um, considerable numbers. Um, and in fact, recent work from England suggests that no native fish species really feed on zebra mussels um, in any meaningful quantities. Um, wildfowl, uh, like the tufted duck, potchard, coot, and the greater score, which we get in Loch Ness, um, do feed on zebra mussels and at times quite heavily. And here's a great photo of a coot uh, actually feeding on a zebra mussel. As we can see here, just being held in its mouth there. Um, but the impacts of, of these kind of wild fowl, these water birds on zebra mussels are generally limited to um, more sh shallow areas of, of lakes and rivers and things like that. So, so the impact in, in Loch Ness may be limited um, and that's something to maybe be considered in the future. So zebra mussels don't really have any biological control in that nothing really eats them, unfortunately. Um, an eradication of zebra mussels from, from already invaded water bodies is generally largely unfeasible, particularly in large lakes like Loch Ney. Localized removal can be can be effective in certain situations, um, particularly if, if the zebra mussels are fouling important industrial or, or municipal structures. Um, and generally this will involve uh, time consuming uh, manual removal, um, literally scraping uh, zebra mussels off the surfaces, um, or they can involve the use of bio bullet strategies, which uh, effectively poison the mussels. Um, but these techniques generally only work in very, very small enclosed areas like the inside of intake pipes and things like that. Um, and they have a real downside that they poison other native mollusks as well. Um, another thing that can be done is that. Uh, Structures can also be made from materials more resistant to colonization. Uh, so zebra mussels do exhibit preference in terms of their, their settlement onto to different surfaces. So surfaces like copper or galvanized iron, which is coated in zinc, they, they don't particularly like. Um, whereas they, they do settle quite heavily on polypropylene plastic um, and stainless steel, which um, apparently they love stainless steel. So uh, control can be carried out uh, preemptively like that. But given the expense and the difficulty of removing or controlling zebra mussels, even in very, very small enclosed areas, really the focus should be placed on prevention, uh, preventing spread to, to, to unaffected water bodies. And this is really why campaigns like uh, Check Clean Dry are so important because they help to prevent the spread of not only uh, zebra mussels, but, but, but other invasive species as well. So it is really important if you're ever near or, or in a water body, particularly if you're going to be visiting another water body uh, later that day or, or any time in the near future, that you really check your equipment and clothing for invasive species. Check everything thoroughly, clean everything thoroughly, including boats, fishing gear, waders, boots, uh, your car, if your car was parked down by the, by the lake or, or, or the lock and everything like that. And really make sure you dry everything out properly for at least 24 hours. As I said, zebra mussels can survive out of water for, for a long period of time, as can other invasive species, um, as long as a week or two out of water. So, so make sure everything is really dried thoroughly. So that's, that's mostly it from me, uh, and thanks so much for listening. And as I said at the beginning of the presentation, this uh, presentation is actually part of Invasive Species Week 2023. Um, and to keep up to date with everything going on during the course of the week, make sure you do uh, get onto Twitter and give InvaseNI a follow, and also stay up to date with the hashtag, uh, hashtag InsWeek, that stands for Invasive Non-Native Species. And you can also follow AFB on Twitter as well at AFB underscore NI to, to keep up to date with what's going on across the organization there. 
And if you ever spot anything that you may suspect uh, being an invasive species, zebra mussel or otherwise, please record it uh, on on either the iRecord app, which you can download onto your smartphone, or the, the online CEDAR system. And you can access both of those things uh, using the QR codes on the screen now. So feel free to, to pause the video and scan them onto your phone. And if you do, and if it's safe to do so, please try and get a couple of good photos of, of the species in question to, to make sure the experts have a good, a good uh, idea of what the species is and they can idea accurately. Um, and really do try to take note of the exact location so the invasive species teams can get out and track them down and deal with them however they need to be dealt with. You can also keep up to date and check in with what's going on at uh, the invasive species team at the Northern Ireland uh, Environment Agency at their website, and that is www.invasivespeciesni.co.uk. And there you'll find over 70 in space, uh, species ID guides for invasive species. So it's a really good resource to, to have a look, to get your eye in uh, when it comes to spotting some of these, some of these things. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of Invasive Species Week. Thank you very much.